Uh, the, the sermon series, uh, I believe, is Then What? Uh, or What Now? Or uh, it's, it's kind of the perception of consequences to come. I, I ran and developed a rehab center for men through Jericho Road. And I worked there and developed that for eight years. And uh, one story was one guy, uh, you know, addiction's a, a fight for your life, and uh, very few people manage to get sober or stay sober. And uh, this one guy, he had broken the rules. I, I suspected that he might have used some, some sort of illegal substance. He tested positive in a pee test. And what I've learned is he was from jail system, and so the goal is to, if he can't make it here, he needs to go back to jail. So I found it ineffective when I say, hey, sorry, you, you, like we're going to arrange a little car trip. Uh, they will put cuffs on you and put your head into the back seat of a car. I've found that that way the person doesn't uh, respond well. And so this particular time I tried to be sneaky about it. I called the police and uh, we were having dinner. It was minus 20 out and he saw the cops coming in the front door and he decided to run out the back door. And when we looked for him, he was gone with no coat. And uh, so one of, and he went running through the neighborhood of the Glebe, man on the loose. And so one of the guys thought that was silly that a man would do that, uh, but that's what addiction does. And so we wrote on the back door, and then what? With a question mark. So you can look at it in the terms of that, like if I choose to do this, then what? Uh, at some point, the consequences will catch up to you. But then we have recovery, we have new life, and it's the same question. Then what? So uh, let's, let's just pray, and we'll get into our text. I'll be reading out of uh, Luke 5. So if you have your Bibles or personal beeping devices, feel free to look at those. But I do believe I will have it on the overhead. So, Father, we just uh, thank you for this time. I thank you for the space here in the Glebe. I thank you for the freedom that we can uh, worship you, that we can sing uh, to you and about you and not be persecuted in this country. We pray for those that are persecuted in the name of Jesus. Uh, we thank you for the freedom that we do have here. Uh, we thank you for your word, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to teach us to uh, open up our hearts to receive what you have to say in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's read about a bunch of fishermen in Luke 5. One day, as Jesus was standing by the Lake of Galilee with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deeper water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down my nets. So we see at the beginning of the story, uh, the, the, I could just picture the, the ocean side and the waves uh, scooping up onto the shore and the, that background noise and there's a crowd starting to form and Jesus is teaching and, and uh, sharing with the crowd and, and the sun's, you know, just coming up and, and, and the appetites are kind of starting to get rumbly and, and so he sees these boats and he goes out onto the boats to, to speak from those boats. So it's kind of a cool setting. I think they've painted a hundred pictures of that. There, there, it's just a cool illustration of, of Jesus being on a boat and, and, and uh, teaching the people that had gathered. And, and after the sermon and after whatever he was teaching, he sees these fishermen and he says, go out and cast out your net. So the fishermen, they, they, it's their trade. This is how they live. So they know how to fish. They know how to make money. They know how to do their trade well. And if we know of the life of Jesus, he was a carpenter. carpenter. Okay, carpenter. Okay. 
thing. <laughs> We're not keeping track of score. There's no score here. <laughs> Everybody gets a gold star at the end of this. <laughs> so we have a carpenter, and he is telling professional fishermen what to do. These professional fishermen had been out all night. That's how they fish. They put down, they know what to do. It's morning time. They're probably a little cranky. They didn't catch anything. Hence, they made no money and they're repairing their nets. But the voice of Jesus, I have found, always requires a response. And Simon answered, we've worked all hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. So he reacted to the voice of God, the voice of Jesus, in obedience. He had his experience, but he understood that, hey, maybe there's a different way. So when they had done so, they had caught such a number, large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come to and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the fish, the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So you see Jesus can build our faith. The, the, what I saw was this, they, they, everything that they knew, how to make money, all of a sudden they just leave that. I don't, I don't necessarily find that true in our, in our lives that, hey, let's just leave something. I think God builds our faith. And it was a miracle that he put so many fish, he put so much provision into their boats that they could trust him. So faith Trust is faith in action. So Jesus made it possible that they would obey his voice. I see that in my life and in our lives. I think Jesus is asking us to drop our nets, to drop what we know, to drop what keeps us safe, to drop what gives us our paycheck or, or whatever it is that our experience allows us to hold on to. I know uh, in 2005, uh, I got to the point where uh, my voice said, it's better that I'm not here. I disappointed my child. I disappointed my wife. I missed birthday parties. In 2005, I tried to end my life for two months. God came to me in this time, uh, and I was on a five-day bender, and I would have not acknowledged that this was God, but I had a voice in my head, and this is five days up, and it was it was a sober voice, and it said, as you were hurt as a child, abused and abandoned, that's what you're doing to your loved ones and your children. And I realized that I was adopted at two years old, and in my adult mind, I would say, good for John Ruby. He got in enough trouble in a Christian home. Imagine him in this environment. And in that moment, when I heard that voice, I realized all my hurt and my pain and my anger and my fury was because I was rejected by a, in a horrible situation. That's how a two -year, my two-year-old eyes perceived it. So I, I, I was weighted with the, the thought of, as I was most hurt and tormented, I'm giving to my children and the ones I loved. And then I quickly saw four pictures. One, dying a violent death. I was in to, to some criminal activities, and that could have easily taken place. I saw quickly a, a uh, jail cell with my arms hanging out of the bars, and I've been in jail four times, so I know that experience. And I, I saw myself in a white padded room in a straight jacket, and I've been at the Royal Ottawa on a couple of occasions. And then I saw what appeared to be uh, fuzzy snow from like a TV channel. The TV quits. I guess now it goes to a blue screen, but back in the day it was a white screen. And I just felt compelled to pick one of those and I know in all three of these, and there is no hope in any of them. And, and I was tired, and I didn't want that, so I chose this white fuzzy picture that I had no clue what it was. And I believe in that moment, I was, it was the first time that I had ever surrendered my will to another, another's will. And what I realized, that was God coming to me. 
and asking me to drop these nets. And the recovery part is a long story. But uh, I'm here today, 10 years later. If, uh, if you had said day one at rehab, you would, uh, you would uh, start a rehab center, you would plant a church, and you would become an ordained minister, I probably would have uh, pushed you down the stairs, and I would have run away. Uh, I wanted nothing to do with it. So my 10-year plan was not this, but here I am today. Thank God. So I had willingness. Uh, I, I dropped what I knew as my solution because what I, what, I got, what I came to know is that drugs and alcohol isn't my problem. It's my solution. What's your net of a solution to... I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I'm accepted. I don't feel good about myself. My solution was drugs and alcohol. Maybe you have your own. And so God asked me to drop that solution and let him be the solution. Matthew 6 verse 31 says, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom first and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And as Jesus became my solution to give me my emotional needs, he brought me to this, this chapter in the Bible and he's saying, drop your nets of security. Because at the time in early recovery, I drive heavy equipment, I used to, and uh, I've been in the elevator union and whatnot and, and had careers. And what I realized what he was saying in this is, seek me first and I will give you everything. So I, I, I quit my job that day when, I, when I, I watched this video with my dad, with this guy that was preaching this message, and it turned on a light bulb. And so I quit my job that day, and I said, God, you got me sober, now get me a job if you want me to have a job. And so I challenged God. I didn't look for a job. I didn't tell anybody I needed a job. And in that time, in that six-month period, I had groceries on our stairs. I had gas in my car at all times. And, and yeah, we found out where the food bank was in Orleans. There is a food bank in the suburbs. Um, but God was saying, put down your nets of security. Put down what you know how to take care of yourself, and I want to. Um, and within six months, I had a job working with mentally ill people. And, and I had that job offer just because I was going to where Jesus was. And one of them was a coffee house. And one of them was a Bible study that was in this men's ministry at Jericho Road. And I was just... Out of the blue, asked one day, hey, do you want to work uh, at an overnight shift with mentally ill people? I'm like, yeah, I do. And, and I had tears for the first time that somebody asked me to work for them. And uh, I had no idea how to do that job, but God equipped me to do that. And then brought me into the addiction ministry and, and equipped me to do that as well. Another, another uh, thing that God asked me to drop was self-protection. And... Uh, from a very young age, uh, my whole life, I remember always having this anxiety. And the anxiety came from not feeling that I was going to measure up, not feeling that like I was going to do something right, and that there was a hammer over my head that was waiting to come down because I was bad. And God was asking me to give this up. So five years of ministry with this, um, what I've learned is that it was a fear of punishment, which is a fear of authority reacting to an offense. So I always had that. In five years of ministry, I became into a dysfunctional relationship and had to take uh, a, a month and a half off of work and, and go into a healing time. And what God said was, if, I, if you're defending yourself, I can't defend you, and I want to defend you. So God was asking me, drop my nets of security. Trust me fully to defend you. That's the good news of the gospel, is that Jesus wants to be your defender. He wants to be your solution, and he wants to be your security in all areas. So the voice of Jesus Christ requires a response. Dropping your nets or discipleship, to me, is about being with Jesus. Not doing for Jesus, but being with Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. 
and, and I've seen so many cultures and, and even in recovery rooms, it's, it's all about doing, it's all about serving. But are we being with Jesus? Jesus wants us to be with him. I know that drugs and alcohol and pimps and hookers, they want to use you. And Jesus just wants to be with me. Jesus made us part of a community and to be able to grow and, and, and just love each other and be with each other. I, I always uh, heard a teaching from one of my uh, mentors and he, he talks about an arrow and every arrow that is self-made is a stick. And we were designed to be made by God, by shaped by community. And every arrow that is self-made is just a stick on the ground. So community to me is a big deal. That's, that's what God has called me into. Uh, he's, he's called me into community and, and stay in community and get sober in community. And sometimes community is hard to be around. People are hard to be around. Yeah. And <laughs> nobody here, but there are people. <laughs> Uh, there was a study that 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 uh, was was part of a uh, big addiction group, and and it was uh, had to do a lot with uh, community and how we get sober. And it was called the Rat Park Experiment. And they put all these rats in cages, and had a water bottle and had a bottle of opiates. And so all these rats in single cages, uh, I think it was almost 100% of them would take the water, but then get onto the opiate bottle and would stay on the opiate bottle. Then they decided to make Rat Park, and it was like Wonderland or Disneyland for rats. They, they had little Ferris wheels, they had roller coasters, they had a cotton candy machine, and the rats all hung out together, and they put the same bottles there, and very few rats ever went to the opiate bottle because they were in community, they were with each other, they were together, and just through that alone, community is such a big deal for us, and Jesus has called us into community, and for us to drop the nets of isolation and self-dependence. Let me answer the question, what is next? I want to answer that question by talking about the old days and what was outside the city gates or what was outside the camp, what they put out. And in the days of Jesus, outside the camp was everything that was unclean, that was not of value, that was not acceptable. The Israelites were commanded to burn the remains of sacrificial bulls, including their poo, outside the, the camp as sin offerings. The leper was to be pronounced unclean by the priest and tear his garments to uncover his head and to cover up his, un, uh, his upper lip and call out, unclean, unclean, and to live outside alone in the city, past the city gates. In addition to leper, there were uh, defiled, there were those who were defiled by dead bodies, and they were put outside the gate. Those who blasphemed and cursed the name of the Lord were put outside the gate. If the plague was found in a house, the defiled stones were thrown into an unclean place outside the camp. And if the plague remained, the whole house was dismantled and, dismantled and thrown outside the camp. Those found dis, dis, defiling the Sabbath day were, by gathering sticks, were brought outside the camp and stoned. The warriors coming back from war were, were met outside the gate to prevent defilement of the camp for those garments that were stained by blood of those they killed. Namath was accused of cursing God and the king and was taken outside the camp and stoned. Manasseh removed idols and altars and, and, and other things that weren't acceptable to God and threw them outside the camp. Everything unacceptable was outside the camp. Defilement uncleanliness, impurity, corruption, dirtiness, filthiness, pollution, contamination, condemnation, punishment, and rejection. This is where disease and death were. Anyone who was banished to the outside of the camp was excluded, isolated, and ostracized. Whew. I don't like the outside of the camp. That's... <laughs> John Ruby, why are you reading that? What's the point? The point is, and then next. What next? Let's, let's go to Hebrews 13, verse 11. We read, The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. 
And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate and made the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp. Bearing the disgrace he bore, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continue offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of praise that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifice God is pleasing. Is this any place for the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to be outside the camp? Jesus is calling us to come outside the camp with us. That's what's next. Um, Jesus is calling us not to be consumed with what's happening in the city, uh, building our empires and our kingdoms and our retirement plans and whatever else that is. It's, Jesus is saying, stop keeping up with the Joneses and, and join me outside the city gate because that's where I am Come be with me. Be with the people that are rejected. Be with the people that are no good of society. Be with the unclean. Christians, it's okay to be with unclean people because Jesus has made you clean. Be with Jesus and you will be clean, cleansed. And yet I look at this and, and part of my example, like, okay, why, how is Jesus out here for real? And, and, and part of uh, me getting sober was trying to serve other people. And, and so I found a little uh, deal down at the Ottawa Mission and they would give me uh, chocolate bars or uh, granola bars. And they would give me juice boxes. And uh, every week I would pick them up and I'd take a couple guys and we'd go down to the streets of Ottawa, down Bank Street, uh, up down to the uh, homeless shelters and all through the Byward Market. And we would look for homeless people. And I don't know if you've seen them, they're pretty easy to spot because they're homeless and they're on the street and they have stuff and they just sit there and they're asking for change or whatever. So we, I would go, they're pretty, they can't really get away from you. So it was safe to put your arm around them and, hey man, can I, uh, can I give you some food? I got a, I got a, I got a uh, granola bar and I got a juice box and yeah, they were receptive of that. So my goal was I'll meet a physical need and then I always asked if we could pray for them and get their names. And so 95% of the time, they would say, yeah, please pray for me. And we would say, what do you want a prayer for? And they would just say, and, and one day we were, uh, we were, we start at the, the, the Ottawa mission, and then we go to Salvation Army, and then we drop down to the shepherds. And if you know anything about that route, that's exactly how it goes. If you get kicked out of one, you pretty much end up at the shepherds of good hope. And so that's kind of the last place. If, if you're out of the Shepherds of Good Hope, then you're out of option. There's, there's not a lot more options that you can get except a jail cell, which is probably at that point pretty good. So we're down there and we had a couple of granola bars and uh, we were leaving to go up the road to find our van. And I, I could, out of the corner of my eye, I saw two girls coming at us. And I knew that they were prostitutes and, or, or some sort of... Um, other profession, and I got a little nervous because they were walking with a purpose, and they were walking towards us, and we're the only ones there, so I'm kind of looking, and they're yelling at us. They're like, hey, 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 trying to get our attention. I'm like, keep walking, keep walking, and they kept getting closer, and I got more nervous, and I figured the best defense is throw them off guard, so I whipped around, and I said, hey, you talking to me? And they were like, oh, and they scared them so much they jumped back. And they started laughing, and they said, yeah, hey, do you have any, do you have any granola bars? Do you have, like, what, are, what, are, what are you guys doing? And so we just explained and, and said, hey, uh, I'll give you the rest of what we had. We had a couple little things. And then I said, uh, hey, what's, what's your name, and can I pray for you? And she, she said, yeah, my name is Sunshine, and, and I'd love prayer. And so I put my hand on her head, and her hair was still wet, but it was beautiful spiral curls. This girl was beautiful. And the, the streets had taken a toll on her a little bit, but she still had beauty. And uh, I put up my hand on her head to pray for her, and she grabbed my arm, and I just started praying for her, for the peace of God. And, and I just started feeling tears on my arm, and she was crying. And as I prayed for her, I looked down, and her feet are black, and she's got flip-flops on. And... and that's where I felt God. I don't know if she ever got sober. I don't know. I don't know what happened with her, but I was with Jesus outside the camp. 
And at the end of this, whatever this is, Jesus is going to say, did you do unto the least of these? And that's what's next. Get outside the city. Get outside the camp. And I'm not saying, hey, quit your job. Stop doing that. We're not here to make money. But maybe Jesus wants to bring the camp into you. Maybe our, our society doesn't accept this type of person and this personality and, and this type of uh, ideal and, and maybe Jesus is bringing the city to you and don't be afraid of it and embrace it with love and with prayer. Don't be consumed and changed by it, but be with Jesus outside the city gates. So at the end of our lives, Jesus is going to say, did you do unto the least of these? And I believe that's what's next. When I get sober, when I become a Christian, it's I want to be with Jesus. And he's outside the city gates. He's outside the camp in defilement. He's outside of the camp in, in, in anything that's unacceptable. Or are we being consumed with trying to fit in and meet a certain standard? I like to, uh, I like to just close with questions. And uh, part of what I like to do is I, I, I don't like um, to always hear my voice. Um, I want everybody to experience God for themselves. And so I try to uh, always incorporate time for listening uh, to God. So to me, prayer isn't necessarily talking and talking. I know when I have children and they talk, when they were little, they always had to talk. But as we grow up, as we mature, we, lead, we start to listen. We start to ask questions. When I care about somebody, I ask them questions. How are you doing? What are you involved in? What's, what's stressing you out? And I think that's what God wants to do too because he wants to talk to us. So I'm just going to, if that's okay, give a little bit of an opportunity right now. There's cake in the back. So I'm trying to wrap this up quick. But <laughs> I want you also to be, uh, I also want you to have that experience to hear God's voice. So I'm just going to ask some questions. I'm going to pray to God. Uh, if you want to close your eyes, go right ahead. If you want to write on a, on a pad, go ahead. But um, I'm just going to uh, invite God into that time and speak to us. Father, we uh, thank you that you are real. We thank you that you pursue us and speak to us. Even when we don't even know you, you come to us. So Father... I just want to know where I am right now. Am I, am I outside the gate with you? Am I outside the gate with you, God? Am I looking and preparing for the city to come, Father? Or am I worried about fitting into this city here and now? Father, is there anything that you would like me to sacrifice? or give up to be with you? Is there anything in the way of our relationship? What does outside the gate look like in my life? 